Really excited to have Dr. Brian Bader with us. He is stationed down at the Fort Lauderdale Research Center with UFIFIS. And I'm gonna turn it over to him to uh, present on this research. Thank you, Emily. Uh, hello, everybody. I uh, just wanna thank you for, for tuning in uh, to my, my presentation. And it's, I'm kind of trying to, starting to change how I think about these diseases in the context of, you know, everybody separates lethal yellowing and lethal bronzing. Uh, and I think they're more similar than, than different. And if you kind of lump all of these palm phytoplasma diseases together, uh, to put into context that this has been going on for a while, uh, to be precise, we're approaching a century of phytoplasma disease in Florida. Um, you know, LY first started showing up in the early 1900s, uh, and it was the predominant problem for quite a while. And then lethal bronzing picked up uh, the torch and is now currently the major issue. But it seems like uh, it's been here for almost a, a century now. And um, with my research program, I'm an entomologist by trade, but I do plant pathology research also. So I've uh, been working hard to try and bring a different perspective to this, uh, this issue. Uh, in the past, it's either been solely focused on the pathogen in the plant or uh, even less work done on, on the insect vector of, of lethal yellowing. Uh, and the problem wasn't looked at from a integrated approach between the two two fields. So um, doing that, it's, I feel helpful for getting a better understanding of not only the epidemiology of the disease, but how to uh, potentially effectively control it. So today I'm going to discuss the epidemiology of palm lethal decline phytoplasmas in general. So I'm going to kind of lump everything together for this discussion. Um, and where it's relevant, I'll kind of branch off and discuss specifics about either LY or, or lethal bronze. And also uh, bring that into context with regard to uh, the insect vector, uh, Haplaxis crudus. So to give everybody a background on you know, kind of a crash course biology lesson on, on these phytoplasmas and what they are, uh, it's a type of bacteria uh, technically speaking, and uh, throughout history, tech, these phytoplasmas, they can only be identified based on their DNA sequence data because we can't culture them uh, in artificial media in, in the lab. So we have to base the taxonomy on, on DNA sequences. And the system that they use uh, up until recently was based off of a a specific gene called 16S. And uh, recently we've, we highlighted that the system was not good and we're, we're trying to, to fight with the kind of the international committee on, on how to classify these things, which is not terribly important for the applied aspect, but um, it helps us understand uh, kind of the basic biology of it, which ultimately uh, influences our, our management decisions. Uh, but basically, throughout the Caribbean, uh, there we found that there are three distinct species of, of palm-infecting phytoplasma. And uh, I have here on the top of this phylogenetic tree, it says Candidatus phytoplasma palmi, Hispaniola, and Aculeata. And uh, palmi is what historically has been called lethal yellowing. Hispaniola is an obscure one that's in Dominican Republic in Mexico. We haven't seen it here uh, yet. Uh, and the aculeata at the bottom is what we commonly call uh, lethal bronzing. So those are the three that are present in palms uh, throughout the Caribbean basin. And for today's discussion, it'll primarily, it'll focus on 
uh, the lethal yellowing and lethal bronze in phytoplasma. Um, so these phytoplasmas are somewhat notorious throughout the region because uh, they cause a lethal decline in susceptible palm hosts. And uh, in some countries, uh, like U.S., palms are primarily um, an ornamental plant, and they're grown for ornamental purposes. Uh, so it's it's not like there's large scale ag production. Uh, when you get into uh, like Jamaica, some of the larger Caribbean islands, and then mainland Latin America, you start to see more production from a commercial standpoint uh, for the, the food products. Um, so, but regardless of which industry is hit, uh, it's a significant problem because it, it, it kills the plant uh, outright. So uh, it causes severe economic losses from this, from this perspective. And here I have a map that has kind of, that shows the distribution of uh, these phytoplasmas throughout the region. And you can see they're pretty much uh, all over. Um, and the countries where there's not uh, a red mark or the regions where there's not, doesn't mean that it's not there, it just hasn't been, been documented yet. Um, and probably most of these uh, islands in the Caribbean have uh, some form of palm lethal decline uh, infection. Uh, just hasn't been been documented yet. So this is uh, just to highlight the distribution and just a, an example of a coconut. Uh, and this one in particular is infected with lethal bronze. So uh, for the host range, I want to specifically focus on lethal bronzing. Uh, because that is the predominant phytoplasma in Florida right now. Uh, we still see lethal yellowing from time to time, but it's extremely rare and has pretty much been displaced by lethal bronzing. And we're not sure why this has happened. Um, it, it could be, so the we think that lethal bronzing was brought in from somewhere else and introduced to the state of Florida. Um, and that's probably what's what's happened. And the difference between lethal bronzing and lethal yellowing appears to be host range. So where a lot of the palm species that lethal yellowing infected are more common or restricted to the southern part of the state, uh, lethal bronzing infects uh, phoenix palms and cabbage palm, which have a much uh, more widespread distribution. So you can get cabbage palm all the way up to into the, the Carolinas. Uh, and then phoenix palms, you can find west all the way, all the way to the west coast. Um, not of Florida, but of, of the United States. So it's a, um, the potential for spread and thus economic impact of LB is much higher than LY ever was because the host range is ultimately going to allow for a greater geographic spread. Uh, here I've summarized the hosts of the documented hosts of lethal bronzing. Now, not each species is equally affected. Uh, some of them are very rare to get the infection, uh, such as Bismarck palm, Carpentaria, uh, each of those, we've, <clears throat> excuse me, we've only seen one case. Uh, however, phoenix palms, cabbage palms, uh, they're dying by the truckloads uh, of LB. Um, pindo palms also are pretty commonly affected. Um, and then in the center table, those are not species that have been documented as host in Florida. Uh, the top three were documented in Mexico, and that bottom one was a host from uh, Louisiana. But I got an email this morning from a collaborator at DPI uh, who lives in Gainesville, and he said uh, 
he had a trachycarpus fortunae in his yard die, and it was positive for lethal bronzing. So um, these hosts could get infected here. It's just we haven't seen the samples yet. Then on the right, uh, I have new hosts listed from my re previous presentations. Uh, the Acrocomia aculeata is the, I don't remember the common name, I apologize. Um, but it is a, a common palm in Latin America. And it was originally known as a host of the subgroup B phytoplasma. But through our molecular work, we found that B and D, which were different strains or believed to be, are actually the same phytoplasma. So I in included that as a host of lethal bronzing because of that, that change. Uh, Ranga and Glari, that's the photo I have below, uh, is the dwarf sugar palm. Uh, recently, we had confirmed that as positive for lethal bronzing. And the bottom one is a uh, needle palm, I believe is the common name. And uh, we got a recent uh, confirmation that that is susceptible as well. Uh, so now for lethal bronzing alone, we're up to 19 confirmed hosts. And uh, like I said, this is just for lethal bronzing, but of an important note, we recently found uh, lethal yellowing present in declining cabbage palms. So you know, there's appears to be distinct host ranges for these line lethal bronzing. Uh, but it seems that if, you know, the conditions are, are right or wrong, I guess your, your perspective on it, um, they can inf uh, infect uh, other hosts that are more, appear more susceptible to, to one pathogen or the other. So uh, just an important note that LY has been found in, in cabbage palm as well. Uh, but uh, there does appear to be a distinction in host range uh, predominantly. But right here, this is the current host list we have in Florida. Uh, and as the disease, uh, it appears to be uh, picking up steam going south. Uh, and I think once it gets more established down here, where there's a higher density and diversity of palms, we're going to see this list grow. Uh, uh, quickly in, in years to come. So, uh, but the spread north, uh, it's happening, but a much slower pace. Uh, and I think just that's simply because of the lower uh, diversity of palms. And then uh, pretty much north of um, Orlando, you just get naturally occurring cabbage palms along the roadways, you know, some Phoenix palms, and so a few cold hardy palms in the city centers, uh, but it's not like uh, down, down here where you have pretty much palms lining every inch of, of roadway that, that you can find. So I think that's why the spread south is uh, going much faster than, than going north. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a fatal infection of palms. And basically, regardless of whether it's lethal yellowing or lethal bronzing, uh, the symptoms are going to be the same. The end result, obviously, is the same. The palm dies. Uh, but basically, what happens is the first sign of infection, uh, assuming it's the right time of year, is that the, the fruit drop prematurely or the inflorescence uh, becomes necrotic and, and rots off the, the plant. So if that happens, it's, a, it's an indicator that it's a phytoplasma infection. Uh, following that, you start to see a discoloration and death of the oldest fronds in the canopy. Uh, so this image here uh, from left to right shows the progression of um, the leaf uh, death in the palm canopy. And pretty much what happens is it, the, palm, the fronds die in uh, kind of a layer. So the oldest fronds die first, and this gradually moves up into the canopy, killing younger and younger leaves. And approximately a 50% uh, canopy loss, the spear leaf collapses, excuse me, 
uh, due to the apical meristem uh, dying. And that's when essentially the palm's dead. Uh, however, it still can maintain a few green fronds even after it's died, and, but eventually those are going to dry up and, and fall off. Uh, that picture towards the bottom right where most of the leaves are dead and there's two green ones, uh, that plant's already dead, uh, but it's uh, still got a few, um, uh, some green, green foliage left. Now, uh, stepping back to include the uh, LY phytoplasma plus lethal bronzing, uh, there are uh, over 30 spe species of palm that are susceptible in, in total. So there's a handful of species that were documented early on from LY uh, that were susceptible but those were palms that, uh, to my knowledge, are not grown, excuse me, in central or northern Florida. They're more restricted to, to south Florida. Uh, and I think they pulled those samples from uh, Fairchild, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, but all in all, there's over 30 species of palm that have been documented as susceptible to this class of pathogen. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's going to likely increase uh, over time. Uh, so now I want to talk about a little, a little bit about what's going on with the plant itself when it gets infected. Um, I showed the, the symptom progression uh, where you have the, the discolored leaves uh, and the uh, healthy fronds, and then uh, at what stage the spear leaf collapses. Now, one of our early interests was understanding uh, what the distribution of the pathogen was in the plant itself and why it might be causing these symptoms. So we designed a few experiments where we took palms at different stages of decline and we did some uh, PC, uh, quantitative PCR analyses along the length of the trunk of these palms and that allows us to quantify the target number that we're looking for. So we can get an approximation of how much phytoplasma is in a given sample. And then we can look at this along the length of the trunk and see any gradients or um, areas where there's higher or lower amounts of phytoplasma. And what we found was that in palms that are earlier, excuse me, in the disease cycle have a higher amount of phytoplasma at the bottom of the trunk than near the top. But once you get to the, like the moderate stage of the symptom progression, you start to see a high, it, you see the same trend where there's more phytoplasma at the bottom, but then it decreases as you go up the trunk. But then when you get close to the meristem, just below the crown, you start to see an increase again in phytoplasma. So there's definitely different, um, like an uneven distribution of the phytoplasma in the trunk, uh, which is kind of useful for, for two reasons. It gives us better sampling recommendations to tell people that if a palm's uh, symptomatic, uh, that phytoplasma is everywhere in that trunk. And you can just take a single sample and that's enough to, uh, to get a positive read as to whether or not that palm is infected with phytoplasma. Uh, but also, this is kind of showing us, uh, giving a clue as to what the phytoplasma is actually doing to the palm. Uh, and this was supplemented uh, when we extended the testing by quantitative PCR into the canopy. Uh, we found that the phytoplasma was only present in the spear leaf. It was completely absent from symptomatic leaves. So, this with the distribution data from the plant itself, uh, we found, or excuse me, the trunk itself, we, what appears to be happening is that when a palm is infected, the phytoplasma moves to the bottom of the trunk uh, and then gets pushed systemically throughout the rest of the plant. And that's reflected by there being a larger concentration of phytoplasma uh, near the base of the palm 
uh, relative to the, the, the other regions. And the absence in the leaf tissue that's actually dying tells us that the actual symptoms and death of the plant are a physiological stress in response to where the phytoplasma is essentially inundating the vascular network and starving the plant uh, to death and not allowing uh, the movement or circulation of nutrients uh, throughout the plant. Uh, so here I wanted to show a map highlighting the differences in distribution of these two different phytoplasma diseases in Florida. On the left, uh, I'm showing kind of the introductory point of LY where it was first documented from in the Keys and its subsequent movement throughout uh, southern Florida. And lethal bronzing on the right, you can see, was introduced further north on the western coast and has spread over a much larger geographic area than, than lethal yellowing. So, uh, and this is, I think, going to be, uh, this is important relative to the, the vector movement throughout the region, which I'm gonna uh, touch on here in a moment. Uh, but this uh, map here highlights specifically the spread of uh, lethal bronzing. I don't really have this data for lethal yellowing because uh, LY was before, uh, kind of before my time, uh, so I don't have that data, but I've, I have a little bit more uh, current data on lethal bronzing. Uh, the research kind of started before I got here, but uh, I arrived at the kind of on the upward uh, spike of, of infection cases and, and uh, impact of the disease. So you can see how quickly over a 10-year period it made its way throughout the state uh, to where now I would be willing to bet that you could find it in every county if you really looked. Uh, so uh, it's the, the spread and distribution seems to be uh, increasing uh, in certain areas uh, and it remains, it still remains very high in central Florida. Uh, but like I said earlier, it's spreading very quickly to the south, and we're starting to see it a lot along the highway in Broward County. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the southern limit was kind of Fort Pierce on the, the eastern side of the state. Uh, and then from 2016 to now, I've seen that uh, March south, uh, you know, first it went into West Palm Beach, where it's really bad right now, and now it's even starting to show up into um, in the Broward County along the major roadways. And the next stage of that kind of invasion, so to speak, is now that it's along the roadways, it's going to start creeping um, further inland and further towards the beach um, by by way of the insect vector. So that'll now bring us to the, uh, the vector component of, of, the, uh, of my research program. Now, LY was uh, first officially documented in the late 40s, but there have been some reports in the Keys earlier than that. And it was like really in the 70s when it hit the mainland that it became a big problem for for South Florida. And a lot of the early uh, research efforts uh, surveyed palms around the area for plant hoppers to try and identify what the vector was. And uh, the plant hopper that I have pictured here, Haplaxius crudus, uh, was confirmed to be the vector of lethal yellowing in Florida in the late 70s. And then recently we've confirmed that it was the vector of lethal bronzing here in Florida. And the group in Mexico has also uh, confirmed transmission with this, with this passive pathogen. So we know this insect is capable of transmitting uh, LY and lethal bronzing. It probably transmits that other phytoplasma as well. Uh, but I, that one hasn't been, been confirmed yet. Uh, so the specimen on the left is an adult female, and the specimen on the right is an adult male. 
So you can see the female is uh, slightly larger and the scale bar there is one millimeter, just so, excuse me, so you're aware. And they do look a little bit different. Uh, the female is a little more robust, has a darker coloration to her body. Um, and the male has a much lighter complexion uh, and has a much narrower uh, abdomen. So uh, in the field, they kind of hang out on the underside of leaves and they're about the size of a grain of, grain of rice. So they're not particularly easy to spot, uh, but once you get a search image for them and know kind of where their habitat is, uh, you can pick them. They're, they're on um, just about every palm in, in South Florida, it seems. Um, so we confirmed that it was the vector. Uh, we've developed and optimized a protocol for doing transmission uh, to confirm that it was capable of transmitting the, the phytoplasma. So if you remember earlier where I said that we found that uh, the phytoplasma was restricted to the spear leaf and it was absent from all the other fronds in the canopy, uh, what, you know, that's helpful for understanding the uh, pathology of the um, bacteria in the palm itself. It also provides a, a, an alternative uh, tissue for sampling and testing, but it also gave us an idea for how to develop new experiments for uh, understanding the vector biology. So what we did was knowing that the spear leaf harbored the phytoplasma, uh, what we did was we harvested uh, sections of the spear leaf, brought it into the lab. And in this image, you can see, we went out and collected a bunch of uh, adults of Hephaxius crudus and exposed them to the palm fronds and let them feed for uh, the minimum time required for access to it is two days for it, the insect to become infective, uh, but five days is optimal. So, we would feed them on the spear leaf, and then we would transfer them to these tubes that had a little cap filled with a, a sugar solution. And we covered it with parafilm, and we let the insect feed on this sucrose solution for uh, X amount of time. We basically, we let them feed until they died. And then we would go through and test the sucrose for the presence of phytoplasma. And uh, because of the nature of it, the concentration is going to be extremely low. So we used what's called digital PCR, which is 100 times more sensitive than the uh, qPCR assay that uh, a lot of researchers use. So it allows you to detect um, your target pathogen much sooner uh, or much easier uh, than other techniques. And in some cases, the standard tools aren't ever going to be able to detect the pathogen, uh, but digital PCR uh, allows us to uh, detect things that are a, a much lower uh, titer. So uh, the, these images here on the bottom are, it's a microchip that we, basically we take our PCR reaction and spread it over the chip and each of those little pixels is a PCR well that's extremely, um, it's like 700 picoliters in volume, very, very small. So basically you're replicating your reaction 20,000 times and each blue dot represents positive amplification of the phytoplasma DNA. Um, now this technology is used in all sorts of different systems. They use it in uh, human pathology for detection of uh, HIV viruses, uh, or HIV, excuse me, and uh, also screening for uh, cancer and rare mutations in, in humans. Uh, but we've adapted it to, to our, our plant, our palm uh, phytoplasma pathosis. So now, with that, with that data where we tested the sucrose as positive for phytoplasma, and we were confident that the that crudus was in fact a vector of, of this phytoplasma, uh, it's kind of put some wind in our sails to start looking at this species specifically to better understand the biology, 
so that we can ultimately try and manage it both in nurseries and in the urban settings. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background on the vector itself. Uh, the adults feed on the palm foliage and the nymphs actually feed at the base of uh, a variety of grasses. Uh, they've been documented from over 40 species of grasses and I've seen this hopper on at least 30 species of palm. So they're both uh, generalist feeders, which is a problem for management, but um, uh, I, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, the range is extremely large. Uh, in North America, uh, the farthest north I was able to find this is in Southern South Carolina. And if you go west, I think Central Texas is the western limit to the, the range of this insect. Uh, but this bug is known from uh, the Caribbean basin. Uh, it's in Mexico, it's in all of the uh, little islands throughout the, the region. Uh, it's in Central America and it's in Northern South America. So it has a huge uh, range distribution. And from various survey efforts done by other researchers and myself, uh, it's probably the most common uh, overall species that you're going to find on, on palms in the Caribbean. So uh, here's an image. Uh, I'll admit I'm cheating in this picture. Uh, that is not actually Haplaxius crudus. It's a close relative, uh, Nymphomindus caribea, but they look very similar. They do the same thing. Uh, but this was just to highlight the behavior uh, and how this insect uh, likes to rest. They prefer palms that have that nice fold to the leaf. And I believe uh, they do that because it's a nice safe uh, shelter uh, because this insect has evolved in a region that is prone to annual hurricane pressure. So over time, what happens is uh, the whenever there's movement, or rapid movement of the fronds, uh, the insect likes to be on a part of the leaf where it can just kind of back into a nice little corner and hunker down uh, to, to weather out the storm. But that's just a kind of a, you know, a larger hypothesis that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, but that's, uh, that may or may not be why they do that, but what's for sure is that they do that. So uh, when you're sampling or looking for them, you need to look on the underside of leaves and kind of close to the folds. And that's where they, they tend to, to like to hang out. Um, now, because of the size of many palms and the propensity for the adults to feed on the, 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 the palm fronds, uh, targeting the adults in any IPM program in Florida uh, at least from an insecticide approach, I don't see as practical or possible uh, because they're, like I said, they're generalists. So they are on just about every palm that you're going to look at. So you have to, you'd have to treat enormous amounts of area uh, to gain control. Now that's, you know, doable in a palm nursery but in urban settings, when you have different homes, businesses, parks, uh, natural areas where you, people don't you know, want to apply insecticides, uh, you're not going to be able to attain the degree of control that's needed to knock the vector population back. So um, our big effort recently has been looking closer at the NIPs uh, because uh, we've done a study in the nursery to try and figure out what kind of habitat the nymphs prefer. And it appears that the, big, the biggest factor that determines distribution and abundance of the vector is suitable nymph habitat. It's not adult habitat because the adults are happy on palms uh, and there are palms everywhere. So um, it's not, that's not what's determining their, their range and distribution. It's it's the uh, habitat that the nymphs find suitable. So we started this uh, project in the nurseries where we found, so how they grow the palms, they have these raised beds and then ditches in between. And we 
went through and started sampling and uh, we would dig up clusters of grass and dirt and then turn them upside down in what's called a Berlazi funnel where you turn a light on over top and the nymphs then try to escape from the heat. So they climb uh, downwards and then they drop into a vial of, of ethanol and then we can, can count them. And what we found was that I think the exact number was nine, the exact percentage was 96% of all of the nymphs that we found were in the ditches between the beds. So in this image here, you can see there's uh, like three rows of palm in the bed. And then on either side, you have the ditch with that really long grass. And in those ditches, we think because of the, lar the larger grass, it's a little more protective and the accumulation of moisture uh, we think the nymphs really like that habitat. Uh, so that is in very valuable information for us to provide management options where, um, you know, in palm nurseries, if there's disease pressure or concern about the vector, uh, it can be as simple as uh, cutting back or removing the grass and putting a different cover crop in the ditches themselves. Uh, and that will knock back the vector population uh, significantly. So the next stage of this is we're trying to understand the difference in palm height uh, to uh, nymph habitat preference. So there's different plots where palms are a different height. And I'm starting to suspect that palm, there's like a Goldilocks zone for uh, suitability for this, their, their reproductive cycle, where they don't like palms that are too small, uh, but they don't like palms that are too tall. Now, they'll feed on tall palms if that's their only option, but the palms like in this image where the fronds are very close to the ground uh, appear to be the optimal um, habitat for the, for the adults because when they go to lay their eggs, it's just a, it's a much shorter distance and it's less risky. So there's less chance of, you know, birds or spiders picking them off if they're going straight to the grass from the palm frond. Whereas in larger palms, it's a much riskier journey. Um, and then smaller palm fronds, the plant's not that big. So it's not as, uh, it doesn't have as big robust leaves for the plant hoppers to hide. So these kind of, uh, uh, Young mature palms are, are seem to be the most uh, desirable for the adults to feed on, which in turn results in a higher number of nymphs in beds with shorter palms than with, with taller palms. Okay, so now I wanna get into some of the more interesting large scale movement patterns of it, Haplaxius crudus and how it's actually uh, influenced the disease, how the diseases got introduced to the state in the first place and how we figured that out. So, uh, and we're using LY as a case study uh, and this approach that we've done with LY, we're, we're continuing with lethal bronzing uh, and Knowing how it got introduced to Florida, it's, it doesn't do much for resolving the current issue, but if we can identify them, how these things are getting in here, uh, it can help us be a little more vigilant and maybe give us an opportunity to prevent uh, the introduction of other palm infecting phytoplasms. There's one other one that we know about, but that doesn't mean there aren't other uh, strains out there that have different host ranges. So, uh, you know, figuring this out can, by a few degrees of removal, can, can help with, with management. Uh, so basically, as I mentioned, LY got introduced to Florida in the early 1900s. The disease itself was first described in the late 1800s in Jamaica. And it was in the early 1900s when Haplaxius crudus was first described from palms in Jamaica. And 
what we found was that, um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So one experiment I wanted to do with the Flaxius crudus, it started as just a general interest. I didn't have any intent for it to be anything groundbreaking uh, or significant in terms of disease. We wanted to assess the genetic variability of Flaxius crudus throughout the state of Florida. So we set off collecting specimens from everywhere we could find them throughout Florida. And we analyzed uh, about 300 specimens. And we found uh, that there was a measurable level of genetic variability of Hoplaxis crudus in the state. We found four distinct haplotypes uh, throughout Florida. And that was, uh, you know, we kind of expected it. We, we figured it was a very common insect. It was um, widespread. So we anticipated to find some genetic variability. So that was, that was fine, interesting, um, and good. But the real surprise came when we, we looked at the uh, outgroups. So basically, what we had to do was collect from populations that would be far enough or isolated enough from Florida to truly be a distinct population uh, as a way to calibrate. So we could know what level of variability we would expect from one population to another. So uh, from my collaborations and survey efforts throughout the regions, uh, I was able to get populations from uh, Jamaica, uh, Costa Rica, and Colombia and then a couple from Mississippi and Texas. So these outgroup populations were a way for us to uh, see what kind of variability we would expect. Uh, we expected that what we found in Costa Rica was going to be uh, different than what we have in Florida and what was in Costa Rica would be different than what was in Colombia. And that what was in Colombia was different than what was in Jamaica. Uh, just to see what percentage difference we would expect and if our populations in Florida kind of fit that, that level of variability. Um, so it, it worked. Uh, we found distinct haplotypes for Colombia. And in Costa Rica, we found two distinct haplotypes. The surprise came when our Jamaican samples came up as 100% identical to the predominant haplotype in Florida. And that's when things got exciting. So generally that meant that either the Haplaxius crudus in Jamaica originated in Florida and moved to Jamaica or Jamaican specimens moved to Florida or both. It could be going both ways. So because of the genetic results, we looked a little closer. And that's when uh, the pieces of the puzzle started coming together where um, we found that Crudus was absent from Florida uh, prior to 1926. Uh, all of the collections and surveys that were done uh, had never documented it here. Despite the species being known from 19, uh, in the early 1900s in Jamaica. So that was interesting. Then LY appears for the first time in the Florida Keys around the time we start finding uh, crudus in the collections from South Florida. And LY was also described from Jamaica. Then my collaborator in Jamaica, who works for the Coconut Industry Board, looked at the historical records and found the, the evidence that coconuts were being moved from, from Jamaica to, uh, to Florida uh, during this time period. So, all of this evidence together suggested that LY got to Florida because a population of crudus was brought in from Jamaica on the plants they were bringing. Uh, and then that subsequently allowed for uh, the dispersal of crudus throughout the, the state. Um, so it was a, an interesting find and it's, uh, it's, evidence that this species is moving around the Caribbean uh, 
and getting introduced into to areas. And it's tricky because a lot of times when you talk about invasive species, it, people imagine that it's a species that's not known from Florida, uh, that's from somewhere else, it gets here and becomes a problem and established. Um, those are somewhat easier to figure out than a species that we already that um, we already have here. So if crudus was absent in Florida in the early 1900s and then got introduced and now it's here, there's nothing to say that it, the, that it populations can't be introduced uh, again. And the other haplotypes we're finding throughout Florida are evidence that there are other populations out there, and these may have moved in from other locations, potentially have brought in lethal bronzing. And that's what we think happened again with lethal bronzing, is that a population of crudus from somewhere else, maybe Mexico or Texas, came in and caused the outbreak of, of um, lethal bronzing. But like I said, it's, it's a lot harder to find, to determine this when the species getting introduced is already in the region. It's just a population that's from somewhere else that's coming in. Um, they're no less riskier to our, our palms or our plants or agriculture um, because they could be carrying uh, pathogens with it. So this was kind of an exciting study that helped us understand a little bit better the movement uh, and behavior of the insect and these pathogens throughout the region. Uh, now, the my favorite part of my job is going off and collecting bugs on palm trees throughout the region to potentially identify new threats. That's what's uh, I find very very exciting. Uh, and as it turned out, we identified a new species of insect in Jamaica, uh, Eclius macaspringi, and we we published it a year or two ago, and. Uh, we have evidence that it is also a vector of lethal yellowing. And this phylogenetic tree here shows that it is one of the more distant relatives uh, relative to Hypaxias crudus. But the fact that it also can acquire the phytoplasma and the salivary glands, this is the chip image showing the test that the phytoplasma is present in the salivary glands, which is a indicator that it is a, a competent vector. Now, if this insect is also a vector in Jamaica, who's to say there's not other species throughout the region that are also capable of transmitting? So, uh, okay, crudus is getting introduced and moving throughout the region, but if there's other insects out there capable of transmitting it, we need to know this so that we can uh, properly monitor for the presence of other insects that could uh, transmit the the pathogen, because this is where it gets complicated with the dynamic of the host range of the pathogen in the palm, but then the host plant preference of the vector also adds another degree of um, complexity to this, this uh, pathosystem. So all these interconnected variables um, make prediction of what's going to happen where virtually impossible, but knowing what's out there and what's a risk is a critical component to uh, identifying problems should they get introduced here uh, and basically figure out what's going on faster so we can implement uh, strategies uh, sooner and hopefully prevent the damage that we're seeing with, with lethal bronze. So this is to further drive home the point of the risk. Uh, that Eclius is kind of a uh, oddball in terms of the relationship to crudus. This is showing other species of Hoplaxius that are, feed on palms throughout the Caribbean. Um, and you can see how similar they look and how easy it would be to overlook them if you're, you know, if you're just looking on a palm and you see a little yellow hopper, um, you know, don't assume it's crudus. It could be one of these other ones. Uh, and in my mind, any one of these, I would guess, has the potential for transmitting these, these pathogens. So uh, this survey work is, um, yes, it's fun, it's enjoyable. I like going out and collecting bugs uh, and identifying them and discovering new species. But 
uh, the group we're focusing on do pose a significant risk to uh, the epidemiology or a risk to the palms uh, and contribute to the epidemiology of these, these pathogens. Um, so this here is kind of a summary of what we've done so far with the species of insect. Um, we found uh, 16 new species of insect uh, and three actual new genera. And uh, I just wanted to show uh, some of the specimens we found to highlight the kind of the bizarre uh, look of, of these insects and how I think they're, they're, rather, they're rather beautiful in their own way. Um, but so far we've con been conducting survey work in Costa Rica, Jamaica, Antigua, and uh, Colombia. And um, over time, we're going to start branching into to other areas. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you to my, my lab and funding sources, and I'll be happy to uh, field any questions.